we're continuing in our study on the book of Joshua. Uh, Joshua is a book about victory and success, and so we've titled this God's Road to Success. Today, I, I, I want to suggest that the road to success avoids deception. All right? Uh, yesterday, we were traveling, and uh, we got to, uh, you know, we, we go by the GPS system. Anybody here use GPS? Yeah, we, we, we listen to that voice. And, and uh, it wanted me to turn on an exit ramp that was closed down. Well, that kind of drives my computer, my, my little GPS unit, crazy, right? Uh, because it wants me to do something I can't do. And so I drive a little bit further, and I, I got to turn around. And it's telling me, turn around, turn around. And so I turn around, but it takes me to the same place. I can't go, all right? It wants me to get on a, a ramp that I can't go. And, and finally, we got a program into it, alternate route, all right? And sometimes in life, we're asked to go down the wrong path, all right? And there's convincing argument. The thing is telling me to go down, but there's barricades on this road. But it's telling, and it's making good, good reason. It's telling me, this is the way to do it. This is the shortest route. This is how you get there. But it's not. And as, as well-intended as it meant to be, <laughs> it was deceptive. I can't get there that way. I'd have had a wreck. I'd run into a barrier, can't do that. Well, today I want to talk because it's Reformation Sunday, and it just so happens to align with our passage in Joshua. I, I want to talk for a moment about Reformation Sunday. 500 years ago, uh, coming on October 31st, they were in the Middle Ages. Some people call it the Dark Ages. Because civilization had been sacked by the barbarians, and back then, a lot of things were held in guilds. They didn't have them written down. They kept their guild secrets so that they had power over you. You had to hire them to do their jobs. And so a lot of people were kept in ignorance, and, and just the people who knew the trades had the secrets to those things. In the Middle Ages, deception had overtaken the good people in the church. I don't know how else to put it. Uh, they were being taught because they, they were basically illiterate, uh, truths, uh, things that were supposed to be true, but they were not. They were not. It was at that time a place called purgatory was invented. How many of you here have read through their Bibles? How many of you read, at least one time all the way through your Bibles. Have any of you found the word purgatory in the Bible? It is not there. It's not there, folks. It was invented as a place Okay, it was invented as an intermediate place after death before you could get to heaven a person must go there to undergo Purification so as to achieve holiness that's necessary to enter into the joys of heaven You see you don't get holy enough here on earth You got to go to purgatory and finish paying for all the things you've done wrong and once you finish paying for all those You get to go to heaven. Is that in the Bible? No, but that became doctrine Hmm there's a lot of things we believe today that are not necessarily so. They're just not so. Not so. Purgatory was not in the Bible. Well, guess what? There was another erroneous doctrine that arose based on that because there's a way to make a buck on everything. Do people make a buck on religion? Oh, yeah, they make a buck on religion. Even today they make a buck on religion. Come on. Another erroneous doctrine was developed that a living person, I'm alive, but somebody has died and they've gone to purgatory, that they, I, the living person could buy the person who died out of purgatory by paying to the church an indulgence. And back at the time of Martin Luther, there was a guy by the name of Tetzel. He was going around. He had been certified by the Pope to, to be able to actually sell indulgences and release people out of purgatory. And this was not a true doctrine. Is it in the Scriptures? No. 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 The indulgence money then was taken and it was used to construct St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Anybody ever been there? Have you been there? Raise your hand. I've been there. Beautiful, beautiful place. And I, you know, I was always convinced, okay, well, the Baptist's going to go to Rome and I'm going to meet the Pope and the Pope's going to become a Baptist. <laughs> Didn't happen. He wasn't there that week. Oh, man. You know, the one time I go to, 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 to St. Peter's, it's absolutely gorgeous. You know, there are some things that are built on blood money. You know what that means? It costs somebody's life to provide the money. This was built on soul money. Soul money. Trying to sell people salvation, a bill of goods that's not true. 
in order to build this huge monument, this huge monument. Well, there was a Roman Catholic priest, uh, actually a monk. His name was Martin Luther. He was Catholic. He's a priest. He, he's studying in Germany, he's a, he's a doctorate in, in theology, and, and he's doing research and he's studying the book of Romans. Anybody ever read the book of Romans? There's a line in the book of Romans that the just shall live by faith. Man, he's deeply convicted. He's looking at the day in which he lives, and he's looking at the scriptures, and it doesn't measure up to the word of God. And so he's got to do something about this. This guy, Tetzel, man, he's selling people a, a false bill of goods. And so he makes 95 theses. These are propositions to challenge the existing order of the church. He writes out 95 because he wants an intellectual debate with those on the other side. And he nails them to the chapel door in Wittenberg, Germany. This became the very beginning. Now, it happens on October 31st in 1517, and we call it Hallow Eve, a Hallow Eve. It was also known as All Saints Day. And you see how the world has distorted things? Hallow Eve became Halloween. And rather being a day of reformation and getting back to the truth, it's become a day of candy. What else? horror movies, and all the rest. It was twisted around. It got twisted. Uh, this coming Tuesday night is All Saints. Uh, this coming Tuesday night is Hallow Eve. But it's gotten distorted. Now, it's not the only distortion. There was a Roman, there was a Roman holiday. Uh, it was a pagan holiday that just so happened to coincide with Resurrection Sunday. Anybody know when Resurrection Sunday is? Resurrection Sunday comes right after Good Friday when Jesus rose from the dead. Well, the Roman pagan holiday was called Easter. And today, what do we call Resurrection Sunday? Easter. We stole their pagan name and gave it a good, to a good, good event, the resurrection of Christ. In our culture, they've stolen Halloween and given it to a night of debauchery. He nails his 95 theses. This is what's going on on October 31st, 1517. Luther's 95 theses that he nails exposes the deception that is going on publicly in a public forum, and he uses the Word of God. And getting back to the Word of God and not the doctrines of men is what the Reformation is all about. Thus says the Lord. He's challenged on that. He says, on the word of God is where I stand. I stand on the word of God. The Middle Age period there, you know, just before the Reformation, was not the first time the people of God were duped by deception. You see, 500 years ago, before that, in the Dark Ages, they were being, being sold some uh, false doctrines. It's not the first time that deception... Uh, has duped a people of God. In fact, Paul writes in Corinthians. He says, ah, but I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived, there's deception. Remember how Eve was deceived? She was in the garden and a serpent came and said, oh, has God really said that you can't eat of all the trees in the garden? A subtle little cast of doubt on the word of God. Has God really said? Is this really true? And here he's saying she was deceived. He says, oh, God doesn't know what he's talking about. The, the day you eat of it, you will, you will not surely die. Your eyes will be open and you'll know truth, of the good and the evil, just like God does. You're going to be just like God. Deception. He's deceiving. He's twisting. He, he, he's, he's lying. Jesus calls him the liar from the beginning. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the, the serpent, your minds may have somehow been led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Later, he says, he says in Colossians, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you. You know, you can be deceived. Anybody here ever been deceived? <laughs> Anybody here who hasn't been deceived at some point in life? Of course we have. You can be deceived. And he's saying, listen, when it comes to spiritual matters, you can be deceived. 
He said, we're in a spiritual war. A mighty fortress is our God. We sang that. Why? Because we're in a war. You've got to have a fortress. You've got to have your walls up. You've got to have some protection. He said, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to, to, to devour. In fact, in another place, he says, uh, Satan is an angel of light. Satan doesn't come to you as this creepy lion, although that's what he is. He comes as an angel of light. Beautiful. It's not the ugly and the scary that lures me to sin. It's the beautiful, the attractive that allures me to sin. But behind all of that is this lion ready to pounce on me. And so he's told us in the spiritual war, put on the full armor of God that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That's the word I want. Schemes. I like the King James Version of that. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He's wily. And that brings me to our text here today. This passage has to do with deception, the people of God being deceived. Uh, kind of like uh, the people in the day of, uh, of Luther, uh, kind of like in the day of, of Eve, they're being deceived. He says, now when all the kings of the west of the Jordan heard about these things. What did they hear about? Uh, they heard about uh, Ai, and they heard about Jericho. They heard about the crossing of the Jordan River. They heard about the, the crossing of the Red Sea. They heard about all these things. When they heard about all this and knew that, hey, they're right there. What happened at Ai and Jericho? The Israelites annihilated everyone there. And so it says they, they, the Hittites in the north, the Amorites in the south of the land, he says the Canaanites right in the middle, along with the Perizzites right in the middle of the land. He says also the Hivites and the Jebusites, they all came together to war against Joshua. They had a confederate of these city-states, and they're out. Kind of like today, we Christians feel like everybody out there is to get us. Everywhere you turn, there's something new that's against the Christian, the Christian... All these nations had gathered together and they made a, a pact. And then the next verse says this. However, when the people of Gibeon, the Gibeonites, when they heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, that they had totally annihilated those two, two uh, cities, they resorted to a ruse. Now, a ruse, I, I looked that up. I want to look up what a ruse is. And here's what Webster says. A wily subterfuge. Wily. They, 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 would, they, they resorted to a scheme. A scheme. Now, some of you remember this character. Anybody here remember who he is? Who is this guy? He's Coyote, right? Anybody know his first name? Wily Coyote. Why, why is he Wily? He's a schemer. This guy's got more schemes. Oh, my goodness. This guy... Him and uh, Acme uh, Hardware Company, wasn't it? That he's always getting every gadget contraption. He's got every scheme in the book to try to get the roadrunner. Folks, we're the roadrunner. The devil is Wiley Coyote. In this text, the Israelites are the roadrunner, and the Gibeonites are the wily coyote. They've got a scheme up their sleeve that they're going to go after the Israelites and deceive them. And you know what? Joshua and the Israelites are just people like you and me. These are not superheroes. They're just common, ordinary people like you and me who are prone to deception just like you and I are. We're prone to deception. Well, there's gullibility here, and uh, usually deception takes the gullible. You know, sometimes I, I, I tease with my, my grandkids, and they'll look at Grandma and say, is he telling the truth, or is he just pulling our leg? <laughs> you know, because when they're gullible, you know, I can sell them a whole, whole bill of goods, all right? And uh, the, it says they, that is the Gibeonites. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn out sacks of old wineskins and cracked and, and mended. What they had done is, is they said, well, we're going to make everything look really old. 
This donkey was like what you'd find at Cracker Barrel. You know, it's got all the stuff on the walls. It's old. <laughs> They're making it look old-fashioned, really old. And it says, and they patched their sandals and their old clothes had patches on them. They, they, they took bread, but they made sure it was all moldy. And they said, they come to Joshua and they said, we have come from a distant country. You know how far away they were? 25 miles. Long way, folks. A distant country. Make a treaty with us. There's something going on here. They had done their homework. I'm sure of it. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 10 through 20, if you were to turn there, you would read, you would find that God had spelled out with the Israelites how to do war. And when you, you'll go to a, a distant city that you're in warfare with, the first thing you do is you offer them terms of peace. And if they will accept the terms of peace, then you make them your servants. If they refuse the terms of peace, you conquer that city and you kill all the men so that they won't rise up later against you because they were not subservient. But he said you do this only to cities that are a distance because your job is to go in and conquer this land and wipe out everybody in the land of Canaan and take no prisoners because if you let any of them remain, they will tempt you with their idolatry and take you down. Now, for those of you who have read the rest of the Bible, you know that they didn't obey the Lord and wipe them all out. And sure enough, the next book of the Bible, Judges, is written because they are constantly falling into idolatry, idolatry, idolatry. God has constantly got to raise up someone to rescue them, to rescue them, to rescue them. And if they had only listened to them, to God, and wiped them all out, there would have never been a book of Judges. Isn't that amazing? Hmm. They knew that they could make terms of treaty somehow with a distant country. They had done their homework. Often, People who are not believers do their homework better than Christians who are believers and know what to say to you to stop your witness so that you are ineffective for Jesus. They had done their homework. So Israel said, Joshua's leader, but, but perhaps you live near us. <laughs> yeah, good thing to ask, right? How can we make a treaty with you if you live near us? Because he knows what Moses commanded. You can't make a treaty with somebody in the land because you're supposed to wipe them all out. He goes on, he says, oh, no, no, the, Jebu the, the Gibeonites say, oh, no, we're your servants. They said to Joshua. He goes on and says, Joshua, I said, well, who are you and where do you come from? I like what they, what, how they respond. They said, oh, oh, we're your servants. They don't tell them who they are. Oh, they're going to say, hey, we're Gibeonites. Did you ever notice that those who oppose us, they're not always honest with us? You get that? You think Satan is honest with us? The devil is honest with us? Do you think his emissaries are honest with us? No, they never are. Your servants had come from a very distant country. Oh, yeah, full 25 miles away. Because of the fame of the Lord. See, they even know the Christians, God's name. Later in time, uh, King Hezekiah is going to have a guy come and say, Oh, your God told me to come here and destroy you. <laughs> you know, they, they try to flip our faith on us. He says, for we have heard report, reports of him, all that he did in Egypt and our elders from Gibeah, they don't tell him that, our elders from our distant country said to us, take provisions for your journey, go and meet with them and say to them, we are your servants, make a treaty with us. That's the one thing they know from what Moses said, hey, if it's a distant country, you can make a treaty. They're using the, the, the Hebrew scriptures against them here. And they're doing it in a really wily, scheming way. He says, look, this bread of ours was warm when we packed it, but now see how dry it is? It's old moldy. Hey, and these wineskins, they were new, but see how they're all cracked? And our clothes and our sandals, they're worn out by a very long journey. We've come a long way. They're lying, they're lying, they're lying. Are you seeing this? The men of Israel sampled their provisions and Joshua made a treaty of peace. They bought it hook, line, and sinker. They did. You want to know why? It's right there. They neglected 
they did not inquire of the Lord. They did not inquire of the Lord. I think a lot of the things that we're deceived by is simply because we did not inquire of the Lord. Where does the Lord speak to us today? It's right here, folks. It's in this book. God speaks through His Word. How do I speak to God? I go to Him in prayer. I go to Him in prayer. They did not inquire of the Lord. They didn't go in. Just imagine if they had gone in and had a little conversation with God. And said, hey, Lord, these people are here. They're telling me that they've come from a long way. Look at their... And God would say, whoa, hold hold on, hold on. Uh, Joshua, are you paying attention here? Um, If they're coming from a distant country, wouldn't they have supplies enough to get them back to? Uh, How did they run out of bread? Wouldn't they have brought a baker along with them and baked new and thrown out the moldy? Uh, Don't you think they would have brought enough clothes to take them the full distance and the distance back? Uh, Joshua, pay attention. Don't you think if they were coming as ambassadors of a king from another nation, that when they came to the king that they were trying to come, in this case Joshua the leader, you don't you think they would have put on their best clothes to impress the king? And just imagine the Lord saying, uh, Joshua, you're a little gullible. Pay attention. Watch what's going on. There's another way they could have inquired of the Lord. We're told in the, in, in the, when they constructed the temple, the high priest had a garment, not his garment, he had a breastplate and it had 12 stones representing the children of Israel. And then the back side of it was a pocket. And the pocket had two, two stones in it, equal size and weight and texture, but two different colors. They were called the Urim and the Thummim, lights and perfection. And you could go to the high priest, and, and, and Joshua could go on to the high priest and said, hey, uh, are they really who they say they are, or are they not? Yes or no? The priest would have prayed over it, reached in, pulled out, And if it was the light color, it would have been, yes, they are who they say they are. If it would have been the black one, it would have been, no, they are not. And they could have inquired of the Lord. But you know what they did? Remember the verse we were looking at? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. They were relying on themselves. They were neglecting to get an inquiry from the Lord and as a result Joshua made a treaty of peace with them and let them live and the leaders and the assemblies all ratified it with an oath they swore well the humiliation follows it says then three days later after they'd made the treaty with the Gibeonites the Israelites heard that they were neighbors aha how embarrassing how humiliating they had just been taken hook, line, and sinker. They're living near them. And so the Israelites set out on a three-day journey. And they, this is where the compromise begins. But the Israelites did not attack them. They didn't attack them. Because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. They had bound themselves It was like a contract that they couldn't get out of. They were sworn to it. To their own hurt, he is going to keep his word. We don't have much of that today, do we? A guy does a a, a deal on a handshake, and then later he he, he reneges on the deal, and he says, oh, you don't have it in writing. Show me it in writing. You should have had that in writing and signed, because his worth is nothing. His word is nothing. We live in a culture of uh, lawsuits everywhere, and we live in a culture where people uh, uh, are, well, they take you to court. We we live in a culture where there's a practice of, well, I don't have to worry about this marriage. Isn't a marriage a contract between two people? Till death do us part? I'll just renege on that. I'll just renege. Uh, In business practice, business practices, we do the same. I held, we held stock with Kmart and, Kmart declared uh, bankruptcy and we lost everything. Then they reorganized, went back into business, never paid me. Are you kidding me? They owe me. 
I, when I was a boy, I read this. It was in a daily bread. Anybody read the daily bread? Yeah. I read a daily bread. I remember this as, as a teenager, that there is no debt so great or so old that a, a righteous man does not pay. Even though this went against Joshua, he knew that the right thing to do was to keep his word. I am going to have to suffer the consequences of keeping my word. The whole assembly grumbled against him. You know why? Here's why. If they conquer them, they get to take all their possessions. This is like money in their pocket. It costs them something. It costs them something too. But all the leaders answered, we have given our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, we cannot touch them now. It's going to be on us. Oh, foolish me. I entered into an agreement and a contract. I've got to abide by it, even if it costs me something. This is what we will do, he says to them. Oh, he said, okay, you've, you've deceived us. We're going to work on that deception. You wanted terms of peace, we're going to grant terms of peace, but you're all going to be our servants. You said you're from a distant country, I'm going to treat you like you were from a distant country. That was the agreement that we were in. They said, what we'll do, we'll let you live, but the wrath will not fall, um, so that wrath will not fall on us for breaking the oath that we have sworn to, to God. You see, what, what he's saying here? If I don't hold to my word, God is going to do something about it to me. We flippantly renege on things we say, and God says, I know what you said. I know what you did. And Joshua said, I, I don't want to be on that side of this. They continued, we're going to let them live, but let them live as woodcutters and water carriers for the entire community. Hey, listen, Israel, all of you, just like the terms that were in Deuteronomy chapter 20, when you make terms of peace, they will become your servants. We're making all of them our servants. They're going to be our woodcutters. You never have to go out and cut wood. You just say, hey, give me a night. Go get me some wood. You don't have to go draw water anymore. Hey, give me a night. Get some water. They are going to be just as, treated just as the terms of their contract. So the leader's pro promise to them was kept. Joshua then summoned them. He said, why did you deceive us? Why did you deceive us? Tell you right now, usually the why question never gets a good answer. Because normally they say, well, I don't know. But this one they do know. Why did you deceive us? We live a long way from, by saying we live a long way from you, while actually you live near us. You are now under a curse. Why did, why did you do this? Because now you're under a curse. You will never cease from serving as woodcutters and, and water carriers for the house of my God. And they answered Joshua, your servants were told how God had commanded. You know what? They have faith in God. They believe what God commanded Joshua and the Israelites to do that they were going to do. He commanded to wipe out the whole land, to wipe out all of its inhabitants. So we feared, you know, fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. They feared for their lives because of you, the people of God. That's why we did this. There's the answer. We did this because of fear of the God of the Israelites. God of the Israelites. So, so we are now in your hands. Do whatever seems good and right to us. So Joshua, wow, watch that word. Save them. Save them. Because they had such faith in the command of God, of Israelites, to destroy them, they threw themselves on the mercy of the Israelites, ultimately their God, and righteousness to do the right thing, and Joshua saved them from the Israelites, and they did not kill them. And that day, he made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the community and for the altar of the Lord. Wow! These people are now servants of Jehovah. They're servants of Jehovah. They're carrying the, the water, they're carrying the wood, they're, they're servants of Jehovah. And that's what they are to this day. That's the day in which the book was written, the book of Joshua. I want to tell you the rest of the story. We've got to leave the book of Joshua for this. You see, Joshua kept his word, even when he was lied to, 
even when it was going to go against him. Fast forward 400 years. It's not so with King Saul. You'll see as we look at this passage. During the reign of David, David was the king following Saul. Saul had already died in battle. It said, but there was a famine for three successive years. Year number one, David said, whoa, these times are tough. Year number two says, hey, Ben, are we going to make it? Year number three, in his mind, I'm, I'm speculating, David says, uh, there's got to be a reason for this. Why are we having all of this, this famine in the land? And so what does David do? So David sought the face of the Lord. Duh, it only makes sense. He goes to God and says, God, why is this going on? What's happening? What's going on in life here? Why, why is there famine in three years? This is the land that flows with milk and honey. What's going on? What's wrong here, Lord? And the Lord said, it's on account of Saul. Saul. The king before you. Now, the king before him was not a really good king. He was a mixed-up spiritual guy. He, when it came to, to do what the Lord had commanded, he didn't do it. God told him to go wipe out the Amalekites, all of them, and he didn't do it. He brought some back. God told them not to do, to, uh, to, to wipe out the Gibeonites, and Saul did that. It's on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It's because he put the Gibeonites to death. We're not told in the Scriptures why or where or when this all happened. We only have the conclusion that something was going on in Saul. Saul did what the Lord told him not to do, and he didn't do what the Lord told him to do. The Gibeonites are wiped out. We don't read of them in the New Testament anywhere else because of Saul. Saul. I'm saying all this because on this Reformation Sunday, I want you to take this with you. I want you to take this with you. Don't be deceived like Eve. Don't be deceived. Don't let him trick you. Don't be deceived like Joshua, who let the, Canaan, the Canaanites here, the, the Gibeonites, come and deceive him. Don't be deceived. Like Saul. Don't be deceived by your own wants and passions. Don't be deceived. So I know what you're thinking is, how do I stop deception? Let me give you the answer. It's in one verse, found in the New Testament. I love this verse. 1 Timothy 4.16. Watch your life. It's like this. I need a mirror in one hand, and I look at myself. And he says, and watch your doctrine. I have the word of God in this one. I read the word and I look in the mirror. Am I what the word says I am to be? Is life, is my life, what I'm doing, my actions, is, is what I have in my life matching what is in the word? Watch this verse. It's got a promise in it. It's a promise. It's beautiful. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. If you do that, you're making sure your life is in harmony with the Word. You are living out the Word of God. You persevere in them. Even when, when you're, you're being bombarded with temptation to do otherwise, you, you, stay, you, you keep true to the Word. You stay true to the Word. He says, because if you stay true to the Word, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. You want to save your children? You want to save your grandchildren? You pay close attention to the word and to the doctrine and you will save both yourself and those who hear you. This is my ministry verse. If I pay close attention to the word and to my life and I keep them in balance and I'm living it, not just talking it, my congregation who hears me, not only will I be saved, they will be saved too because God will work in your hearts and you will do God's word too. Because as I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and you're a follower of me, we're following in the same footprints and we're doing the word of God and we, we, we will not be deceived. Martin Luther did that. He read the word and he looked at his culture. And the culture was a church that had gone idolatrous and many other things. And, and he said, it, it it's not what the Bible says. And he tried to reform it. But if you've read the insert in the bulletin, you know that the Pope excommunicated him 
and forced him to start his own church, which was called the Lutheran Church. There were other branches of the Reformation. Among them was a group called Anabaptists, because Anabaptist, the word Anna means to be again. And if they were accused by other people of being those who would baptize again, well, the Baptists would say, no, I really, that first time I just got all wet. Somebody hit me with water. That's not baptism. Baptism takes place after you believe. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And then they were baptized. They get saved and then baptized. And saying so, later that word Anna on Baptist got dropped and was just called Baptist. Baptist. I say that because Bethany Church is Bethany Baptist Church. Our roots are Baptist. We go all the way back to the Reformation. And the Reformation continues if we continue in the Reformation. And what is that? Sola Scriptura. The Bible alone. This is my creed for faith and practice. I build my life on the Word of God, not on the doctrines of men. If I preach something here and you say, whoa, wait a minute, let me look that up. You look that up and you say, hey man, that's not right. I'm going to tell you right now. Believe the Bible and consider me a liar. <laughs> Okay? The Word of God. And see, that, that is the spirit of the Reformation. When it came to salvation, I am saved totally by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ alone, not by works of righteousness, but according to His mercy, He saves us. Don't be deceived by anything else. Let's pray. Father in heaven, in this Reformation Sunday, we do not want to be a people deceived. So that means we must be a people of your word. And so we ask that your Holy Spirit would illumine our minds so that we would understand the word of God as you have intended it and live with a clear conscience before you, O Lord, that my life is being lived according to the word of God, not the doctrines of men not the traditions of men, not the political correctness of my age, but solely based upon the word of God so that the Reformation may continue, that we might proclaim that salvation is through the Lord Jesus Christ alone and no other way than faith in him to get to heaven. Help us be such witnesses, I pray in Jesus' name.